today in the June baby site and um, you know there's a it's it's in the middle of a housing state which is what you'd expect but there's a lot of history and a lot of meaning for our culture and for um, the story of our people and obviously for the Catholic Church um, for me there's also the story of um, you know the the emotion of the people who walked here one time the the experience of them because my own mother was born in a mother and baby home it was Sean uh, Sean Ross Abbey in Tipperary um, and uh, you know I inherit a personal story from my mother from my grandmother and from my great aunt who uh, reared my mother um, and I also have a story of you know, the couple of years before your mother was born, half the babies in Sean Ross Abbey died. And here somewhere, the nuns murdered 800 babies and threw them in a septic tank. And I have to make sense of all this, um, I also have the experience of what has actually been done for my mother and my grandmother. And it's pretty much nothing. Um, you know, there has been no redress. The uh, government has dragged this all out. If there was any compensation, and neither my grandmother or mother wanted compensation, by the way, they both got on with their lives over in the UK, as a lot of these women did. Um, but um, they both died. My, my grandmother died about 10 years ago, and my mother died a few years ago, all waiting for a resolution of this. So, you know, the government hasn't really done anything for my mother or added to the story, yet they've taken this story and a narrative has come out of it which has been very, um, which has reinvented our understanding of who we are and what the Catholic Church was. So, um, you know, it has changed Ireland and it is very much part of uh, this aspiration for a post-nationalist, post-Christian Ireland and I'm not completely comfortable with that because you know all the different uh, the intent of all these different bodies don't match up you know I'm not seeing a resolution I'm not seeing a redemption story uh, I think I see women in care today with their young children I hear the stories from Tusla and I'm asking myself how bad was it for them then and how good is it for mothers and children in care now? So I'm hoping that by talking to Brian uh, Nugent and by talking to um, Eugene Jordan, who have written books about this very site, who have spent hours and hours researching the truth from documents, from evidence about what actually happened here. So I'm gonna to talk to them and see, can I find out uh, where this, uh, the meaning of all this story and where it's all going. So that's what I'm hoping for today. And uh, we're gonna give them plenty of time to tell this story and to walk around this site to give everybody involved justice. Uh, you know, you can say what you like, but there's a process after that, which is open inquiry and due process. And we want due process for the women, and the uh, babies that were born here we want due process for the nuns who sacrificed their lives to do this in a very different era and um, who were very much the um, the uh, you know that the, the uh, bad ones in this story let's look at this and see how things really were did they really murder 800 babies and throw them in the sewer here um, let's find out so Eugene, it's great to meet you at last. You know, Thanks. I'm well aware of uh, what you've been doing, and you know, we we've uh, we've been corresponding before, but we've never met in person. Oh. So thanks for being here. I know you want to be here to tell your story, your research as much as I want to be here to find out uh, what the story is, uh, because I don't actually know. Uh, so 
Were 800 babies murdered and thrown in a septic tank here on this site? I would say definitely no. This has been called a holocaust. This has been called many things, mass murder, mass graves, all sorts of excitable language has been used in regards to this true mother and baby home. Uh, I say no emphatically because um, this is the only holocaust in the history of the world that issued death certificates to its victims. Yeah. Now, you have to start asking a few questions. The first question is, what was in it for the nuns to be murdering children? What benefit would accrue to them? In every other situation, they used to be baby farmers and they were called angel makers over in Europe because so many children died, who would take care of babies that mothers couldn't take care of for a fee. They did it for money. It was in their interest to murder the children so they could still gather the fee and wouldn't have the expense of trying to feed a baby. There's none of that here. I mean, the, the, the women, I'm reluctant to call them nuns because these are women. And let's put it be plain and simple. This is a woman perpetrated holocaust is what they're making out, mm. is that the women killed them. Now, I don't think they the, the had the motivation to kill them. The Catholic Church and the other Christian churches had been looking after unwanted children for the best part of 2,000 years, mm. since near the end of the Roman Empire, right back in antiquity when Constantine took over. They set up institutions to look after unwanted children. The uh, humanity has produced hundreds, thousands, millions of unwanted children, millions and millions this, the, in the last few years. The UN estimates that I think in, in a six or seven year period that 53 million children have been aborted fairly recently. That shows you that humanity can produce unwanted children. Mm. It is stupidity in the extreme to imagine that all the children born in mother baby homes were wanted by their mothers. In fact, the report of the Commission of Investigation says that many women threw themselves downstairs, drank sheep dip, and took very hot baths in order to bring about a spontaneous abortion. Some of the children were wanted by their mothers, but a great many of them weren't wanted by their mothers. So what you have here as well is an institution looking after the poor, remember. Mm. These were poor people, and the figures released by the Commission of Investigation showed that the vast majority of illegitimate children were not born in mother and baby homes. They were born outside it. Mm. Another thing that comes across is that an awful lot of grandmothers reared their daughter's child. And I know of many stories of many people who only found out they were illegitimate when they went to get their, their certs for, to get married. Mm. That shows that there wasn't the bias in society that we, we are led to believe was in society. Okay. A lot of people didn't even know, even though everybody in the village knew that the child was illegitimate and that the child was uh, probably born in tomb and all the rest of it. The grannies reared the child. Yeah. But that hasn't been acknowledged. Yeah. Well, that's like my great aunt reared yeah. my mother, and she reared other children in the um, in our extended family yes. as well. Um, and I only found that out at our funeral. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so you know that was the time to uh, to be a heroine to look after these children then, yeah. you know. Now it's very easy to attack, um, you know, the nuns and all those, yeah. you know. For, well, if you it, take, it's, yeah. for the last uh, uh, two years, abortion has been uh, uh, legalised in Ireland. Uh -huh. And 13,000, over 13,000 unwanted pregnancies, babies have been aborted. Mm. Now that shows you that we're, even with all the contraception that's available, we're still producing unwanted children. And that's more that have died in the last two years through abortion than have died in the entire 72 years or 78 years, whatever it was, that was covered by the, the Commission yeah. of Investigation. Let's put, let's put figures in perspective and put the whole thing in proper perspective. Mm. You know, that's yeah. one thing that hasn't been done. I have another question to ask you. Uh, when I ran for election in Galway East, um, there was an, uh, a debate on Galway Bay FM and I was on the panel with all the other um, candidates and the very first question was uh, from Catherine Corliss um, who was in the audience and it was would I support a excavation of this site and um, all the other candidates um, came out with the narrative that uh, it needed to be excavated for the reasons we understand today, uh, according to the narrative we've heard. Um, and I 
quoted Brian Nugent's book and I said, Brian has raised a lot of questions about this. My own mother was born in a mother and baby home. I'm not sure about all this. And the interviewer pressed me on it and he said, you give a yes or no answer. And everybody else had said yes. And I just felt uncomfortable with the narrative and I just said no. You know, yeah. I wouldn't support it. Now, w was I right to say that or was it a foolish thing to say? It's, it's a huge moral dilemma, mm. huge moral dilemma. Mm. The children should be allowed to rest, would be my opinion. Mm. Leave them there, they weren't murdered, that's mm. absolute rubbish. Mm. If you, the other problem is that we've had so many allegations made that the evidence maybe lies in those graves that they weren't murdered and maybe we have to excavate it and um, see who the, these children are and what the real story is, that can only be answered through the excavation. Mm. Now, I know Brian has, has a theory, he'd probably be on later, but it extends far further on the map. Mm. The burial grounds extend far further on the map, so there's more to it than meets the eye. Mm. The other part of it is, is that a lot of people, uh, a lot of the women in here were in here as a result of incest and rape. Mm. And there's some stories there that some families might be better off not hearing. Mm. And when the DNA evidence is produced, you might find that your father is also your grandfather. Yeah. And things like that are going to happen in families. And it's well known that the rape cases and all that were, were, yeah. were in here and the incest cases with brothers as well and, and fathers and all that. Yeah. So there's a lot hidden within the ground that might be best left there. Mm. But there's no question they were not murdered. Yeah. In one, uh, just to give you one example, if there is any uh, suspicion of murder or an unexplained death, the law is that it has to be reported to the coroner. Mm. The coroner is a special judge mm. who convenes a special court called a coroner's court and a jury decides what the cause of death is after hearing the evidence. I can only find one of them that was held in tune as a result of a death of a child in the two mother and baby home. Mm. And in that case, the jury had found that the baby died to the mother who was probably feeding it at her breast and lay over on it and suffocated the child accidentally. It was a common occurrence in the past. It still occurs rarely today. Mm. But that's the kind of thing, and that shows that the uh, due process, if you like, mm. of reporting deaths was followed and followed to the T. Yeah. There's been another author, Alison O'Reilly, who, who claims to be the one who broke the story. Mm -hmm. And she claimed that Bina Rabbit, whose name appears in a lot of these death certs, was actually certifying the deaths. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. She's written down as the informant. Mm -hmm. That's a person who's given all the death certs and goes down and sits in the registrar's office and waits to be called in. And then the registrar takes them and enters the copies of the certs on it. And he also records who happens to be in the office and who brought it in. Mm -hmm. This was all followed, and followed to the letter of the law. The doctor here, uh, uh, Thomas Bodkin, he was uh, my predecessor as the president of the Galway Archaeological and Historical Society mm -hmm. for many years. And he was old, he was getting into his 80s, but that was common at the time for people to work on. There was no retirement, mm -hmm. there was no retirement funds. Yeah. And you have to slight his character and say that he was in on it too, and he mm -hmm. must have been murdering the babies, or at least knew it was going on. Mm -hmm. and. The registrar must have been in on it. And then everybody, the police must have been in on it. And like all conspiracy theories, a huge amount of people have to be in on it and yeah. say nothing. Yeah. And that's just rings alarm bells and should ring alarm bells in many people's minds. Yeah. You know, that yeah. there's something fishy about this story. Yeah, that's really where we are. I mean, my, I don't know who my grandfather is on yeah. my mother's side. So yes, I have unanswered questions which may be better off not, uh, and <laughs> certainly my grandmother wasn't forthcoming, yeah. and she could have been, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, and we heard a, a number of different stories, but that's a personal uh, issue. Yeah. I'm looking at, um, even today, I know that's, we, we often think that, or, or this whole story is presented to us as a redemption, yeah. you know, that we had this terrible event, this dark blackness from children in care and mothers and today we're in a very different situation and the, the life of mothers and babies in care, children in care is totally transformed. But I'm still seeing today um, plenty of situations where there are going to be children growing up not knowing what their grandparents' names are either in modern circumstances. And I'm wondering how bad was it really for the girls back then? And how good is it for women and children in care today? Mm. 
That's a, another question I'd like to ask. What's your perspective on that? There's one thing, and I should send you some photographs mm. to illustrate this point. The uh, poverty was, uh, what's the right word for it? It was much more severe than today. The poorest people today are, are rich in comparison. They are fabulously wealthy in comparison to the poverty that once existed here. This is Chum. The Chum site is the, was the biggest home of its kind. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it was never called a mother and baby home. Mm -hmm. It was called a children's home. Saint, mm -hmm. The official title is St. Mary's Children's Home, mm -hmm. Chum. Sometimes just called the children's mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And uh, that tells another story in that a lot of the children who came in here were legitimate. They weren't illegitimate. Mm -hmm. But it's called a mother and baby home designed to uh, mislead people of today. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that going on as well. But the issue of poverty, we have no idea. This was uh, not only the largest, but also in the poorest region in the country. Can you imagine the poverty there was in Connemara and Mayo, uh, mm -hmm. the two counties served by this particular home? It was uh, people on the side of the road. Children didn't even have clothes. They were in, uh, dressed in sacks of flour. Flour used to come in cotton sacks in those days, and they used to reuse them as clothes. The same thing happened in America in the 1930s, and the, the factory workers started printing the uh, sacks in nice Florida prints and all that so that it would make nice clothes for the children. But they would be given away free so that the poor could make, make clothes for their children. A lot of people didn't have shoes, mm. you know? And there was no social welfare or anything like that. There were a few uh, social uh, welfare and charities and that. But the poverty was immense. Mm. Poverty is associated with high infant mortality the world over. The Newsweek magazine headlined in 2015 that Washington's infants, poorest infants, are 10 times more likely to die than the richest. Mm. Now it's in all the academic literature that the poverty has a causal relationship mm. with high infant mortality rates. It's no surprise to find high infant mortality rates and where they're all associated in a, in a one area. There's a hospital effect. Mm. You cannot find out, for example, what the mortality rate is for the, nas the national, the, the university hospital in Galway or any other hospital. Do you know why? Because if we hear of high mortality rates for certain diseases, we say, well, just that's a terrible hospital. That's yeah. the last place we want to go. Yeah. So they published them a few years ago with that caveat that you cannot use high mortality rates to insinuate poor quality care. Yeah. That's what's been done here. We'll do it naturally. Yeah. So, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great, great. No, it's perfect. Yeah, keep so going. So what I was saying was uh, in poverty. No, that was one thing that was missed by the Commission of Investigation. Yeah. You had a, it was headed by three people, a judge, a barrister and a historian. Yeah. They had absolutely no knowledge of medicine or current scientific research into mm. infant mortality. Mm. So they missed the main issue here, is mm. the reason you had a high infant mortality rate here was due to poverty. Mm. There is absolutely no question about it, and we can produce hundreds of papers to say that there is a causal relationship mm. between poverty and high infant mortality. Right. Now you're asking me the question, and I wandered off yeah, a little yeah, bit there, yeah, about no, what it's like fine. today. Yeah. So what it's like today is we don't have the poverty, first of all. Yes. We not only have, not, don't have the poverty, we have vast amounts of money to spend on childcare. Mm. Vast amounts of money. The cheapest is to give them out to foster parents. You get 325 a week if you, you take in one of the ch child and stay care and foster mm. it. 365 if it's over 14 right. or 12 or 14, something like that. The Irish put them in, they pay, they now pay private companies to look after children. Mm. That is to take them out and put them in. It's a phenomenal amount of money. It works out at, I have the figures here because I don't trust myself with yeah. figures. But boarded out children today or 365 per week is the average it costs. I well, think that's a lot of money, isn't it? Just to board out children to somebody. But the overall cost when you take into account sending them out to private companies is 58,000 per child per year. 58,000 euros wow. per child per year. Now that's 121 times more than the 30 odd euro that they were given per child per year in today's value. Yeah. 10 shillings in, in old money yeah. uh, to the, each child that was here yeah. in that. Now, the institutions now cost, wait for it, this is the yeah. figure, 
24,000. One second. Just sure. Yeah. Right there for one moment. I just yeah. lost your microphone. Yeah. Oh, it's, <laughs> just dropped there. Yeah. Yeah. No, no worries, no worries. Okay, well spotted. <laughs> Where do you want me to start out again? Uh, just when you were about to read that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you, sorry. Children and institutions now yeah. cost the state a staggering 24,849 and 89 cents per child per week. Wow. Per child per week, 24, over nearly 25,000 euro per child per week is what Tuzla spends on, on childs. And it's a massive 623 times what was given to the women here to run this home in Chum. Yeah. Now, you think, for that kind of mind, that we would get a great service yeah. and that, the, that women and, uh, uh, and children who are in state care would be getting great treatment for that kind of money, 24,000 yeah. a week. Can you imagine what kind of a hotel? Yeah. You know, you'd be in Dubai for that kind of yeah. money and you'd have plenty of money left over as well. Yeah. But according to the Health and Information Quality Authority, Tuzla uh, is full of shocking failures and inadequacies. Yeah. Shocking failures and inadequacies yeah. for that kind of money. Now it just shows you, it shows you first of all that it's very difficult to look after children in care. Yeah. There's much more to it than that. Yeah. But there's much more incompetence within the system. Yeah. People creaming off large salaries and doing yeah. very little for it in return. Yeah. And the ones that were suffering are the children. Yeah. If you give that kind of money to the families, they wouldn't be poor anymore. Yeah. And the chances are they wouldn't have that money. You'd, yeah. you'd, you'd save yourself, with the taxpayer would be saved a fortune. You know, and the children will probably be far better off with their families. Well, I, I'm you're bringing me on to another aspect of this. Uh, whereas I uh, was a foster carer for two um, lads who, yeah. who were in care, yeah. and um, you know, th the outcomes for those children were that um, you know, were, were very dramatic and, and very. Um, you know, it, it, it was an intense experience. Um, one of the children went on to do very well and he ended up uh, doing a master's degree. And the other left us uh, after a couple of years and he actually committed suicide, you know? So this is the tragedy that we're endured. This is my, about another aspect of my question, yeah. which is how much support for that 20, however many thousand a week, are the children actually getting? You know, I uh, think there's massive questions to be asked about what's happening today in Tusla. And, um, you know, that's the other aspect of my experience. And um, obviously, when you have so much money um, centered around uh, a process, uh, there's all kinds of opportunities for things to go wrong. Mm. I don't think we even got uh, 300 a week to mind uh, the the uh, the children we were looking after yeah. but we were only happy to do it yeah. and we know one thing that when they were with us um, for for what, for all that it uh, it for for what it's worth they were happy with us you yeah. know so that yeah. was that was i think yeah. the family is Foster such an important do, thing do a great you know, job yeah be, being part of a family is so important, it is, it is. you know, and uh, so I think we've um, covered a lot of that. I know I'd like to talk, we, we're going to talk to Brian, maybe okay, you should yeah. talk to Brian. <laughs> maybe I don't know if I should talk is. to Brian, but we'll <laughs> take it on from here now. Okay. So thanks very much, guys. Right. Really Thank appreciate you. that. Right. Okay, right. that's great. So thanks so much, Eugene. Brian, I asked Eugene a question, and the question was, were 800 babies murdered here and thrown in a sewer? Now, Eugene has answered me fairly comprehensively that um, in all likelihood, they weren't murdered. But were they thrown in a sewer, uh, Brian? Maybe you'll answer me that. No, they weren't. So unsurprisingly, perhaps, <laughs> that's my answer. Yes. So, I, I, so anyway, you know, now that we're here at the site, I thought I might show you the geography of it. Yeah. It's just that I, because I have lots of online discussions and discussions in real life mm. with people, and they get very confused. Mm. There, there's a crypt, there's an ossuary, there is a, a sewage tank in the normal sense, and they're all different structures, and it confuses the heck out of people. Mm. So I, I thought, you know, since I was here, and we're at the site, I thought maybe I could just point out some of the places, because, mm. you know, because mm. when you're here and you're looking at it, it might be easier. Yeah. 
So, so, so if it's okay, I'll just, I'll just point out some things to you. Uh, so you see there, you have the um, playground. Yeah. Now, obviously, back there, where you see that, that kind of uh, triangular-looking wall, the, 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 that's part of the old workhouse wall. That's the part of the old oratory of the wall. Yeah. And the plaque there is because they executed six Republicans during the Civil War. Okay. And the, the, that's what that is. Anyway, that's, so that's the parallel structure. That's the oratory. So that's the workhouse, anyway, back there. Now, just just here, about a few feet into the into the playground from this from where we are now, but in the playground area, you have what what is clearly a crypt, because mm. uh, this causes great confusion. So I I just want to point out. You might ask, well, why do I say we have a crypt? Mm. Well, we have an eyewitness. Mm. It's a person called Mary Moriarty. Yeah. Uh, she she was a spokesman for the travelling community in this locality, yeah. and she lived in one of those houses in the mid 1970s. Mm. And there she was just chasing up some children and some stories and she was going over, she pointed out the spot to me personally mm. uh, when she was here, she showed me around and she said she fell into a hole in the ground and while she was there looking around uh, she saw shelving and she saw, I think she said four rows of shelving and she saw all the uh, bodies wrapped in, uh, in a shroud. And she said the distinctive way, she described the distinctive way the raft was very similar to the way the nuns had wrapped uh, her own baby later in the... Um, in, in the Grove, which is the local hospital here. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, that's why we say there is a crypt. There, there are some, some other references to a crypt, but that's the specific one. Mm. So now I can't tell you very much about that because it, it, nothing in the commission report has helped us out on this. Mm. But, it, but it appears that what, what that was, was, was the remains of tunnels. Now that's the other curious thing about this site. You have, you have to say the workhouse is back there and this whole place is apparently honeycombed with tunnels, which you can walk through. There's a, a lot of folklore about this in the locality. I mean, for example, the contractor for the houses around here, the, the, these houses are built about three phases. Mm. And the first two phases was done by a contractor uh, who, who still lives here, uh, lives in Galway. He's in his 90s though. Mm. But he was telling me when they were working here building the houses, that's about the early 1970s, just, just, just these houses, like right mm. beside us here. He said that a guy, an old guy came up to him and said, well, I hope you don't disturb the tunnels. And mm. he told him that you're in an area that's honeycombed with tunnels. Mm. And other people, homeless people in, around Shoon, were lived in the tunnels apparently for a while. So anyway, now there's, there's great significance in stating that there is this crypt. We have a direct eyewitness testimony and we do know there were tunnels. There is documentary evidence on tunnels. And I say that it's very interesting because, uh, as you know, a few months ago, the main historian on this commission, Mary Daly, uh, mm. She taught me, by the way, back in the day in UCD. But anyway, she, um, she gave an interview to some academics in Oxford. You've probably heard about this. Mm. And in that, she was very disparaging of any idea that there was a crypt system on this site. Mm. She said that was complete rubbish. And how could you possibly have that and it cost a fortune and there's no way they would have wanted to do that. But there were tunnels and it wouldn't be that difficult to put in shelving just into the tunnel. Mm. And so it's not that difficult to have a crypt. And we mm. do have a direct eyewitness that there is a crypt. And uh, by the way, I don't understand the relationship between the crypt and here. It could be the crypt was for unbaptized children. I don't know, or, mm. or whatever. Uh, who knows? But anyway, it was, it was about there. So then you have, right, so your workhouse is all back there. The, the boundary wall of the workhouse cuts across approximately there like that and goes up at an angle. So a lot of people don't realize that the boundary wall is cutting across this site. It's not that wall or, or whatever. And well, when they drew up the report on this, they made that mistake. Mm. But it was obvious to me looking at the geography of the walls. You see, you can see that wall coming down here mm. has to join with another wall coming that way. When you look at the, the geography, it was obvious that it had to dissect the site. But a lot of people mm. made that mistake. Anyway, so you have the walls there and you also have uh, what's called a a sort of a water runoff. Yeah. Now we're here in the west of Ireland and it rains a lot. Yes. And people who do a lot of construction work, uh, they have to worry about rainfall, mm. excess rainfall. So, so the, and remember, it's a very flat site. So they did build an underground channel for excess rainfall. Now they, that would have been about a metre square, like that, mm. like that, like that. And it would have come down uh, through about here, almost where you're standing, uh, or from that direction. Uh, and it'd be whatever it is, I think six feet under the ground, mm. about a metre uh, made of cut stone. Mm. It made original to the workhouse about the 1850s or 60s. And, and anyway, so, so, so just to describe it, or, originally then, there is no sewerage in the workhouse. Uh, to begin with because mm. they didn't have enough of a water supply so what they did was they they, they built now remember this site has the walls dissecting like this 
But the rules of the workhouse were that you couldn't have what they call a cesspool. You couldn't store manure on the site. Mm. So everything down here was not part of the site. And they rented it from the local, uh, the local farmer, a fellow called John Daly. Yeah. And, uh, and so, so they put on his f uh, field a square. It's just a simple uh, stone-walled square over ground, maybe about that high. And it goes, it goes approximately to here, to there, to there. Mm. It's, a, it's, it, it's a big area of this, but maybe it's about a third of it. Mm. It's, so, it's a, so it's a stone wall that high up the ground, which they also put wattles into. Mm. Wattles is the local construction to make it watertight, you see. Mm. And, and in that stone structure, they, they would take by, by an ass and cart the manure from the workhouse. They come along with the ass and cart, they simply dump it in here. And this, this area is just, just where you put it all in there and then you sell it to a local farmer because, mm. you know, they need the manure. So, <clears throat> So that was the idea. That's what they call a cesspool. Now, it's not at all like a septic tank. It's an overground structure that you just temporarily put when you're, and then take it away. Now, now, you ask about where we get this controversy, right? Catherine Corliss knows that this immediate area is the burial ground of the Tune Children. This is the graveyard of the Tune Children. So everybody knows it's the graveyard. You look at that gate there, you'll see uh, a monument, uh, if, you know, for a graveyard. You had two little uh, little white crosses on both these gates, that gate there and that gate there. They have different origins, by the way. The, 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 the white cross on that gate was about the 1980s, and the white cross on that gate, I think, might be the 1950s even. So that's why this is the graveyard. Yeah. She knew it was the graveyard. She hit the old maps. On the old maps, of the they show the workhouse, and lo and behold, they show this particular box thing mm -hmm. that I'm describing. So she says, oh, they dumped them in a septic tank because this is the graveyard, and this box area is indeed a big area covering this. So that's what the origin of it is. And that's the mm. only origin of it. There's no mm. other evidence remotely uh, coming up. But anyway, <coughs> so <coughs> we have these excavations of this site. That's another question I asked yeah. Eugene, was during my election campaign, I was uh, asked a question on the Go Away Bay candidates debate, should I support the excavation of this site or not? And all the other candidates said yes. I said I'm not sure. I quoted some of the uh, um, some of the um, work you'd done, and I said no, I wouldn't support it. Was that a foolish thing to say, or was I right to say it? You're, you're right to say it. You're right was to say I? it. Yeah, okay. In my opinion, why? Yeah. This is, this is a graveyard. It's a yeah. consecrated ground graveyard. It's recognised to be a graveyard by mm. everybody, by the county council, mm. by the Archdiocese of Tube. Obviously, the Archdiocese mm. is based here in Tube. Mm. And, I, and I provide documents. And as I say, you see the structure, the little white crosses, the, that plaque in front of it. So why do you take away graves out of a graveyard? Mm. What's the idea? What's the point? Mm. You know, this is the graveyard of the Tube children. So why do you mm. dig that up and then be surprised to find children's graves in here? Mm. The whole thing is daft. But, but anyway, obviously, uh, they did excavate a lot of this site. Mm. Uh, not all of it, but a lot of it. Mm. And when they excavated it, they found a number of things. <coughs> they found a kind of a smaller box. Mm. Now, there's, there's not much remains of the overground uh, box that I described, but they found a smaller box just about here, mm. just about underneath those flowers. Okay. Uh, you know, you see, it'd be like, say, there to there to there, whatever, yeah. which, which is similar to a, um, a septic tank. Yeah. Now, it, the point about that was that, <coughs> that wh while the workhouse didn't have sewerage originally, in time they did try and put it in. And the mm. curious thing is, they actually used the old uh, drain, the old, the old water drain. Remember I said mm. there was excess water that had, a, that had an underground structure went from the, oh, down here. So they used that. They actually yeah. piped the sewerage into the underground drain at the workhouse and they hoped to take it out here. Yeah. It's a bit dodgy because the walls of this drain are, 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 uh, are cut stone. They're not, uh, you know, they're not smooth they're not concrete yeah. but anyway so they had pipes and they had all this in this small box about here which is the same uh, structure as a septic tank yeah now as eugene was just reminding me here a minute ago the interesting thing about this is that this is now a small storage tank now of course they did not find any human remains in that structure full stop end of story mm. and i actually said that if you read very carefully the original 2017 mm. statement they had two mm. structures the sewage one they didn't find human remains mm. in but they they phrased it very carefully in order to keep this nonsense mm. going mm. but anyway <clears throat> but the curious thing was catherine corliss set off not that long ago on a facebook post and puts a lovely picture 
of the septic tank and the pipes coming in and then talks about human remains. Mm. Obviously mistakenly thinking that the remains were there. Maybe that's why they put the flowers there. Mm. Whereas there is no remains found in that structure at all. Mm -hmm. so, so what they did find was along, along that wall, say, say about out a foot from it, uh, and given that about a metre and going down about six feet or whatever in the ground, so uh, along quite a, quite a bit of the length of the wall, but parallel to that back wall, they found this underground structure. Now it has, it has I think, 21 chambers and 20 openings, or 20 chambers and 21 openings, I forgot which it is. And there they found a lot of human remains. Okay. Now, now the question is, who built that structure, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's beyond all question that, that what happened was the council were, were, were developing this site about 1980. They were building that, uh, that, that playground and that access road. Mm. And when they did it, they must have come across bones. It's in, inevitably the case. So, so they just built a modern day structure. And you, you know it's a modern day structure because there's a lot of, lot of artifacts in it which post date 1970. Now remember, the nuns are gone out of here in 1961. Yeah. And, and then they just put the bones into it, put a top of it, and that's all, that's all it is. That's what, that's what they found. It's beyond yeah. doubt that's what's happened. Yeah. And there's, there's, no, there's no issue with it. What's, what's wrong with that? Yeah. You know, so the whole thing is just daft as a brush. Like. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks very much, Brian. Yeah. You've answered my question. I mean, yeah. I started off here um, trying to tie my personal story to how well uh, you, uh, my, my, my mother was born in Sean Ross Abbey. Yeah. Now I heard similar horror stories that half the babies died the year before my mother was born there. And um, so I'm trying to work out how, uh, these, how everyone was treated here. So what I'm discovering as I speak to you is that actually the, um, the nuns did not murder 800 babies that um, also that uh, they weren't thrown in a sewer. Yeah. So my mother and my grandmother have not had any compensation or any inquiry into their um, position, but yet their story, in my opinion, has been hijacked to, um, for a political narrative. Yeah. And I am um, very disturbed by that, you know, and I think there are a lot of people who have had, uh, who, who are struggling with this mother and baby legacy, you know, uh, legacy of ancient Ireland or, or, or um, previous generations, and we're not really any wiser for these kind of horror stories. And it makes me wonder what, um, uh, what, narrative or what purpose this is serving to have this mother and baby story of 800 babies murdered by the nuns and thrown in a septic tank. I have an idea myself that it may be to do with uh, the whole restructuring and re reinventing of Ireland as a post-Christian, post-national country. And I think that that's not what the story of my mother and my grandmother is about. And I don't think it's what the story of these nuns are either. And I think uh, by the sounds of it, um, you know, those nuns, even though life was hard for my mother and my grandmother, and I'll never know what my grandfather's name was, but that wasn't the nuns' fault. And, uh, you know, I'm starting to uh, feel that everybody involved in this story has been treated badly, you know? Uh, by a government that ha doesn't really care about any of this and uh, promoting a story which suits their own agenda. And that's how I'm feeling about it now, Brian. So thanks very much uh, for um, giving me your, uh, your, um, uh, your expertise on this. And, uh, you know, we will take it from here. I'm a little bit... Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a lot goes into these stories from a personal point of view. There's a lot of uh, emotional energy invested in where we get to here. And I'm still uh, no further ahead. I still don't really know where this is all going. But I really appreciate you enlightening because the truth matters. And this is about the truth. You haven't helped me really with my personal story, but you've helped me with understanding the truth of this site. And you, Eugene, have done exactly the same. You know, my personal response is my personal response, but you've given me uh, 
an academic uh, forensic understanding of what happened here. And that helps me a lot because the truth matters. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, nice. yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Very good. Just one question there. Yeah. Well, yeah. just to confirm, yeah. you were saying that yeah. this here yeah. was where they done the excavation, and they actually found no human remains there. Was, yeah. Is that yeah. true? What you just said? There? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so in other words, they they did. There was uh, two periods where they did excavations, and there was, I think, four digs. So on this side wasn't completely excavated at all. Uh, but, but they did about a long line, if you like, and they went from yeah. about here to there and found two structures, there and there. It was like the same sort of dig. You know, I can imagine you yeah. dig up the sod and you go along. So, so that one, as I say, it's kind of like a classic uh, septic tank. It might have right. been about 1890s, 1880s, when they, when they put real sewerage in here that you get that. And as I say, that square, it's only a small square now, it's like that. Yeah. Uh, no human remains in that. No absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. So no human remains. This is not a mass grave. It's a graveyard. Yes, it's a graveyard. Exactly absolutely, it's a graveyard. No, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you very yeah. much for coming here today. Yeah. yeah. You're well done, lads. Right. So you've heard about the controversy, right? They set up a, a commission of investigation uh, to examine this. I think it's about a year later. I think it's 2000. I've forgotten the dates exactly, but I think it's 2014. About March, this blew up. 2015 they set up a commission of investigation or it might have been earlier I can't remember but it's a long time ago at this stage and it, but it's important to understand what a commission of investigation is because I think the general public have this idea in their head that they set up a public inquiry and it's absolutely the opposite of a public inquiry. What happened was a number of years ago, we had a huge public inquiries went on forever. And then supposedly in response to this, me, uh, Michael McDowell, as Minister for Justice, introduced the Commission of Investigation System. Now that, the Commission of Investigation System is very similar to what you get in communist Russia. It has no relationship to normal Irish or English law or of any type of public inquiries. I mean, you know, intelligence agencies don't have the level of secrecy that these guys have. And it's a, it's a complete sham system, in my opinion, anyway. But anyway, they set up the Commission investigation. They told us virtually nothing for about five years. Then they issued a fifth interim report, which is the one that describes this. And then eventually, after an unbelievable length of time, the January this year, they come out with this report, right? Two, two and a half thousand pages or something like that. Now, <clears throat> the initial response to this report was, of course, that it was uh, exactly like you were describing uh, the, 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 there a minute ago. They, that it was all Catholic Ireland, absolutely terrible, the past is absolutely awful, blah, blah, blah. I lived it on for about a few weeks, and it was clearly a snow job of a thing. But the curious thing was, a few weeks later, you know, as people actually read the report, uh, there was a backlash. And now an awful lot of what they describe as uh, survivors, residents, and Catholic courts, etc., are up in arms about this report. Why? Because it's not actually agreeing with their position very well. So, so if we were to summarize this report in broad terms, it, it takes a lot of the individual controversies that, that have been whipped up enormously over the last, whatever it is, five or six years. A, they've basically been kidnapped into going to these homes and, and, and the babies are sold for adoption. So there's compulsion all that. That was just total rubbish and the Commission, to be fair, have said so. They, they, they've just rejected all of that. There's no such thing as sexual abuse in these homes and they also reject the idea of any significant degree of physical abuse in the homes. So if you read it, that's, they're all gone. Then they have this idea, they're starving them to death. That was one of the great things they had relating to this word, marasmus, that Eugene has articulated at great length. They rejected that, they're what? They had to, they had no choice in the matter. This marasmus thing was a, was a giant fraud. They were well fed in the homes, that much is also clear. So now you are left with the reality that all, a awful lot of, of these shibboleths have been rejected by the report. So, so then you have to ask yourself is what's left, okay? What are, why do people go around saying that we have had concentration camps back in the 1940s, 50s, known as mother and baby homes? Why all the hype? What exactly did they do wrong in these homes? At the end of all of that, considering they've rejected virtually all of the main criticism. So I would say you've got three basic areas that, you could, that, that they would still claim from this report. Now the first is, is not, not a very, um, you know, you might say it's not a reason at all, but it's very much in the report. And that is that they have uh, no evidence. They don't have sufficient evidence. Now you might say, what the heck is that as a reason? But you read the main text in this report, and very frequently they say, oh, well, we don't really know what the story is about this one. They state that, and they don't state that in small print in a footnote. They state that in the main text of this report. And I think it's noticeable. I think it's shocking, actually. Because the, as historians, obviously, they know that you can never have perfect information. 
but you have the closest thing to perfect information on the Tune Children's Home and all the other homes that you could possibly get as an historian. I, I would definitely say you've got Rolls Royce sources on this home, huge amount of oral testimony. You have all the documentation that the nuns had to prepare, that the county councils had to prepare, that the Department of Health had to prepare, a huge amount of documentation. They've only got a minuscule amount of gaps. So why do they put, constantly put in this report, oh, we don't know very much about it, we don't have the documentation? Obviously, they're, they're leaving a loophole there for this kind of witch hunt to go through, to say, oh, well, yes, maybe it did happen, we don't really have sufficient evidence to say otherwise. And th that's, that's the angle they're taking. And I, I think it's very noticeable for them to put that in it when they know perfectly well that as an historical exercise, they've got more evidence than they could ever have of anything else. So, for example, they have nothing to ju justify this nonsense about the septic tank or whatever, so they try to squeeze it in to no 1937, where they claim that they, for, for just about a year, they don't have the minutes of one particular meeting. So this is the kind of way they're doing it. So I would say that's one of the ways they're doing it. They're saying they don't have sufficient evidence. Now, the, the second, there's also then two big areas, right, that they're using to claim that these homes are terrible. Now, the first big area is clearly statistics. Now, as we're all told, in statistics, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. But the statistics are supposed to prove how horrible these homes were. Now, the statistic, obviously, they are using is that the death rate in the home might have been approximately twice the, no the nominal death rate in the country. Uh, that's the nominal death rate in the home, as you calculated. It looks to be approximately twice what it is, it, although it's not actually very clear in this report. I mean, this report, for some reason, has very detailed statistics, at least when I was reading it, on, on marital deaths. But all you get is a kind of a graph for the infant mortality deaths. And they, they don't go into great detail. But anyway, that's what the hype is about, about these homes. They have twice as many people died as uh, in the normal, uh, outside the home. But there are enormous difficulties with this statistic. And, I, and I've, I, I've written about this, I have a chapter in the book on it. You, you, you have to understand you know, what's going on here. First of all, <coughs> the simple point is that where do you get the statistics? Obviously, you have the home and they're compiling the death rate. They have a vast amount of documentation in, the, in this home that they have and we don't have. But that's where you get the statistic for the home. You say so many people died in the home because we have it there. And we also have death certificates uh, for the home. Now, you're comparing that statistic to the national statistic. Now, where do you get the national statistic? What happens is you're, you're compelled to register births, deaths, and marriages in, uh, it used to be Lombard Street behind uh, Trinity College in Dublin. And they have a local office all around Ireland. So you die, somebody dies, somebody has to get the certificate there. A birth, you have to get the certificate there. Marriages is usually done through the, the parish priest. And that's true from about the 1860s. And th these are wonderful documents, very, very important. But in the 1920s, 1930s Ireland, before about the mid-40s, when they introduced children's allowances, it was very patchy. The, the actual national statistics on births, deaths and marriages are not all that reliable for, the, for that period. That means that you're comparing the home records, where they have all of these officials and bureaucrats filling out every documentation properly and saying so-and-so lived only six hours after de birth or whatever, versus documentation whereby, realistically, if you were born in a cottage in the middle of nowhere in Ireland, 1920s, 30s, they probably didn't bother register your death. And that's the reality of it. So you're not comparing the two alike. So therefore, the, the home rate looks higher than the national rate because the national rate is not, is not, uh, is not perfect. Not by any means. Now th that, th that's, there's a whole lot of issues with these two. But I, th that's a big one. But probably the most important one has been articulated already by Eugene. I was just listening to him. And this is known as the hospital effect. Now, <clears throat> now the hospital effect is not difficult to understand, but it's very important to this. So, so, so if you think about it, right, we'll say, we'll take an analogy that I think I used before somewhere. But anyway, you, you, you go to the records tomorrow and you find out what is the death rate for those people living in the Gresham Hotel in Dublin. And you compare that with another, you know, comparatively similar sized building, uh, also in, in that part of Dublin, the Matter Hospital. Now you compare, you have 1,000 people stayed in the, in the Gresham Hotel in that year, whatever, 1,000 people stayed in the Matter Hospital in that year, you compare the death rate. I suspect you'll find that a 1,000 times higher death rate in the Matter Hospital than the Gresham Hotel. Oh, why is that? Is that some reflection of the hospital? No, obviously you get ill, you, 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 you ring a taxi or get an ambulance, you go to the hospital, you don't go to the Gresham Hotel. And indeed, if you were ill in the Gresham Hotel, you, they'll ship you off to the Matter Hospital. 
So hence, it's not rocket science, more people die in the hospitals. Now, now this tomb children's home the, uh, and the other children's home, you see, had, had this quality to it. The, the, the home, anyway, it, it is in the report, which was a very important uh, consideration. They said that for those that had been boarded out, if they got ill from the home, they were sent back to the home. And they, they have that specifically the tomb reference. And then also, I was just reading in the, in the pellets town, but, but in the report they refer to as pellets town, where, which is um, uh, you, where we usually know as, know as the Malvern Road. They specifically state there that it was a kind of a convalescent place for very ill children. Now, and in the case also of tomb, I think it's 1930, I have the, the reference in the book, there's a specific advertisement whereby the tomb authorities were looking to set up a special unit for delicate children here at tomb at the site. So hence, you're a delicate child, you're born with chronic illnesses or whatever, anywhere around Galway and Mayo, they sent you into the home. And obviously you're very seriously ill. The death rate in those children is much higher than it is on, on other children. So that, that's another, you know, a very serious statistical issue. Very serious statistical issue. Realistically, and I suspect, looking at that reference to, to Palestine in the report, I suspect that's the answer to, to the high death rate in homes all over the country because they're actually kind of semi-hospitals for sick children. And, and therefore, it's not surprising that you have a high death rate in the home. So that's the second major issue that comes across in this report, the statistical one. And in fact, that can be looked at and can be uh, refuted. Now, the, the third uh, major issue that they're going by on this uh, report in claiming, continue to claim that, that, the, um, <clears throat> that the homes are terrible is eyewitness accounts, oral testimony. Now, well, well, I've been personally articulating for a while that this commission is terrible in the way it treated the oral uh, testimony. But now, actually, that's in the public domain. A lot of people are also saying the same thing. It, it's terrible the way they treated the people. They clearly took oral, oral history from a large number of people and made no effort to incorporate that in the finished text. That's what Mary Daly kind of admitted in, in one of uh, in the, that famous uh, interview with, uh, in Oxford. So uh, it, it, it is terrible anyway. We know that it's been terrible on a whole lot of fronts. But, but, but to, look, to look at it uh, further, and ju and ju just to summarize what, where we are in the Oral Testament, okay. You get about some extreme cases are out there. You get a number of people who are saying unbelievable things about these mother and baby homes. Now, for example, when the report came out, a prime time interviewed a lady who described how she was kidnapped in London of all places by, I think, a priest. And then, uh, and anon, and anon, priest and anon, anon. in a black yeah. car, in a car, in yes, car. yeah, and flown to Cork, and then, and then she has to escape from from uh, that place in Cork, and then goes to Dublin, and then escapes from that one as well. And it's really ridiculous. Anybody who knows these homes, as Eugene does, would just you know you kind of laugh at that. That didn't happen. I'm sorry, it didn't happen. These extreme cases are not true, in my opinion. Uh, no. Uh, anyway, the, 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 these extreme cases are just not true. Okay, that, that's one category of the oral accounts. Now, another category of person, I think, is, is somebody that are highlighting negative things that happened in their childhood, you know, which are quite possibly uh, true. So what I mean by that is you take anybody's childhood in rural Ireland or anywhere else over the last 50, 60 years. I mean, you're, you know, your father, you know, he got angry now and again and gave you a clatter when you didn't deserve it. Teachers gave you a clatter when you didn't deserve it. You know, and really, you know, they have off days, whatever, you're hungry now and again, you're whatever. Anybody can take an incident like that from anybody's life. And if you, if you highlight that and gloss over the fact that your poor old father was slaving away to try to, you know, feed you and clothe you, as these nuns were, you know, then, then you, you know, you, you can always write that down if you want. It doesn't mean it's untrue. When you say that you got a clatter when you should, it might be true. But, but if you're going to be that biased in your account and not take into account how, how good the, you know, the good work these people did for you, then you, know, you can write that if you like. And, and of course, you might like to write that if you think you're going to get compensation for being in this home. And it, really, that's, that, that's a big issue. I mean, these people are expecting to get thousands of pounds because they say it was terrible. I interviewed a person myself uh, describing that kind of thing, and he, he told me, when are, we, when are we going to get paid? He asked me. You know, so, so that, that's a second category in these oral accounts. And the third uh, category, uh, which I, I was hoping to, to read out from here, is that there's a large number of extremely positive oral accounts on this home. A large number of them. And they come out only in this report. It's amazing. Absolutely, quite significant numbers of people are coming forward saying that it was absolutely brilliant and much better than the homes they went to when they had to leave the home. 
They say the nuns were very caring, the food was fantastic, you know, they had toys and that, whatever. Large numbers of people are coming forward to say that, but you just don't hear it in the main media. So, so I think when you, when you examine the oral accounts, you can explain that as well. And I think they're from that, you know, it's not true to say that these homes were, were as bad as that. I think they were good institutions, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the Commission got a lot of things wrong, uh, but they got a lot of things right as well. Yeah. So overall, it's pretty, pretty positive. They managed to get rid of that starvation myth. Yeah. And you notice how the politicians who were promoting it have suddenly stopped about starvation, yeah. you know? Because now it's just not tenable, but it's on the doll record. And there are several of them, and I have it on my website, a list of these politicians and what they actually said, uh, falsehistory.ie. So if you want to go and look that up, it's just crazy. The politicians making out th these falsehoods and uh, putting them out on, on the doll record. Not thinking that it's ever going to come back and bite them. You know, and the fact that it hasn't come back and bit them says a lot about Irish society at present. It's, it's very bad, you know. The, the other thing about the report was, uh, I said it earlier about yeah. the uh, their biggest mistake was not factoring in poverty yeah. into it. And the, the kind of poverty is, comes out in the stories of a lot of people that the, what they had suffered. Yeah. And they were escaping domestic violence in a lot of cases, yeah. incest in more cases and stuff like that. Yeah. And these were refuges. They're still trying to make out that they were imprisoned in these homes, that they were somehow taken out of society and imprisoned in these homes, which is not the case either. Yeah. It's the only prison system in the world where you have to apply to get in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to write an Sorry. application, or someone has to write an application to get into prison. Yeah. I think I'll write one to the Governor of Joy <laughs> yeah. and see can I get in there next Monday, you know, maybe just for a rest or something like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you do the joined up thinking, the whole story falls apart. Yeah. It's very simple for the whole thing to fall apart. The motivation of the women for killing children, what motivated them? There was nothing to be gained. They could be excommunicated by their church and their God. Yeah. They could easily have stayed in a convent and said prayers day and night, yeah. as, as some contemplative orders do. Yeah. But they decided to do something practical. Get out and help the women uh, who, who were in, in crisis, in a crisis pregnancy, yeah. and look after them, and more importantly, save the lives of their children. Yeah. That's what it was all about, saving their lives and saving their souls. Yeah. It's completely against their religion. It's yeah. against everything to do with the religion to be killing them. Yeah, yeah, That's simple. Yeah. And for 2,000 years, they've been doing their best. Now, it's one of the hardest things in the world to rear infants in the pre-antibiotic era, era as well. Yeah. The smallest size little thing could kill them. Yeah. Without breastfeeding as well, yeah. it was very important, especially in colostrum, the first milk produced by a mother, yeah. has a lot of goodness in it that we, we yeah. only really realise now yeah. and if a baby doesn't get that it starts off life with a biological disadvantage yeah and uh, yes yeah, so you know and i prone to the smallest of an infection yeah now the other thing is to say there was no uh, isolation units and all the rest of it but you, you couldn't have isolate we're living a COVID now we have all the isolation and everything and look how fast it's spreading it's still spreading yeah, yeah. measles is even more uh, transmissible than yeah. uh, or infectious than than uh, yeah than anything and yeah. if it gets in it spreads like wildfire yeah. the same with whooping cough yeah. Whooping cough had a huge amount of deaths associated with it. And yeah. if you look at the figures from England, I yeah. think it was 5,000 died in some years yeah. from whooping cough. Yeah. And that was only yeah. solved by bringing in vaccines. Yeah. And it was the vaccines that solved it. But yeah. there's still deaths from whooping cough take place yeah. these days. Yeah. And all the countries where poverty yeah. is high, infant mortality rates is high. Yeah. Maternal mortality rates are high, and nobody in Ireland seems to be able to put that together. Not even our academics. That if you put the two together and look at what's happening today, and then compare it to the past, there's your answer. It's right in front yeah. of you. So, can I ask you about the academics? You, you, you looked at this. Uh, what people don't know is that there was uh, 25 academics or something come forward with an alternative report. And you, you read that. What's your impression? Yeah, 23 have come up with They have reinterpreted the mother and babe, the Commission of Investigation uh, report. And the reason they had to, they had to reinterpret it because they were made to look foolish by the, the report. They're the ones going around claiming starvation, imprisonment and all the rest of it. So they've gone through and it's mainly the, the survivor or the witness testimonies. And they're trying to twist that in to say that these are true and that the commission was wrong. Yeah. Now it was 23 academics who wrote it. Yeah. 22 of them were uh, attached to a law faculty and one sociology. Mm. Not one historian. 
That was a little strange. A, hist a history event like this and a historical scandal, where are all the historians? I thought there was going to be 23 historians all involved in this. So the historians are you and I. <laughs> and the yeah. most decorated historian in yeah. Ireland is, is not a historian. Yeah. Catherine Corliss. Yeah. She's got yeah. all these awards and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yet she's never studied history. She did a course, yeah. uh, you know, and yeah. she's never bothered doing a history degree. And yeah. yet, yeah. is the most decorated historian. No, I think in time, that's yeah. going to come out and that's going to be shown for yeah. what it is. Yeah, so, so you, you would say that as a profession, like a historian, because you, you were the president of Galway, you know, stars, which is a big, big deal not, not so long ago. What's your impression? What's gone wrong? Why, why, why do we get, end up with such a false impression given to the Irish people of this history this period? Yeah. Well, I was telling David earlier on that I think it's cultural bias. Yeah. There's a cultural bias that we have in Ireland, which the academics, oddly enough, call the colonial mentality. Yeah. Now, this happens in post-colonial societies, where the colonizer's culture and, uh, yeah. uh, uh, is seen as superior to our own culture, to the colonized culture. Yeah. So they therefore hate everything Irish, love everything British, yeah. and put the Irish down all the time. Yeah. Now that's one part of the colonial mentality. Another one which we have is in begrudgery. Yeah. You know, we all know about that. We're a nation of begrudgers. Yeah. Well, it's much more than envy. You know, it's it's putting other people down. Yeah. And yeah. if you can put other people down, that means they're beneath you on the social strata, and you're above them. Suddenly, yeah. you're a big shot. You know, yeah. just yeah. by by saying you're a fool or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. when you put you down, that means yeah. I'm bigger. And especially yeah. if you're higher up on the social strata than I am. Yeah. Well, then that puts you beneath me, and yeah. I'm higher. I'm bigger, yeah. big shot than you are. Yeah. That's an element in it that's very, very powerful. Yeah. You, you might have heard of Carl Beach over in the uh, UK. Yeah. He claimed that he was raped by a paedophile ring of very powerful and influential people, including Ted Heath. Uh, Lord Britain, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was he at one stage, or, or the Home Secretary, and uh, a couple of the heads, heads of the armies and all these. They were very powerful people. Not only that, he claimed that he witnessed the murder of three boys. And he supplied the names of three boys who were murdered by this paedophile ring. The police believed him. So he went to the police and he reported it. They believed him. They launched an investigation. He got a case number. You bring that up to the revenue, somewhere like that. You hand it in. And they hand you out a cheque for €22,000 on compensation without a shred of evidence being produced. Now, he was found out. And he was charged with perverting, perverting the court. The, the course of justice, yeah. if I have a drink of water I might be able to get that out, <laughs> but anyway, he was he had loads of charges anyway, and the result was he got 18 years in jail. Wow. Nobody in Ireland who has made false claims, and they have made false claims to tribunals before, have not. I think there was one guy in the uh, Ryan report, he got three months in jail or something like that for making a false, false report. The rest of them can get away with it. Yeah. Now the symphysiotomy uh, uh, ex gratia yeah. payment scheme was handled by Judge Harding Clark and she, uh, she said that one third of the complaints made to that scheme were false. Now she could prove that they were false because he could take an x-ray and see that no, the women didn't have a, a symphysiotomy. So Ireland is full of chancers and a lot of chancers are out there and especially if you're the chance of getting 50, 60,000, maybe 100, 200,000 in compensation. You know, to Carl Beach only got 22,000. That's, that's their kind of compensation. Our compensation would have been 100,000 or closer yeah. to 100,000. So falsehoods are there. Oh, great. Thanks a million. <laughs> so people are prone to, to, to make enough fantastical stories. Yeah. There was one very recently. It's only a few weeks since the floods in Germany. Yeah. Do you know the big floods in Germany? The story circulating in Germany that the bodies of 600 babies were washed up. Yeah. Now it's been circulating on social media and everybody says 600 babies were washed up. It's a completely false story. And DW, the, the German uh, station, went and investigated it. And they got a guy who's uh, he's one of these Austrian websites that looks into fake news. And he said that babies, uh, uh, children and babies are particularly important for conspiracy theorists because it stirs the emotion and people get more emotional about it and they're less inclined to believe, um, they're less inclined to be, be cynical of the information that they get. So this is why these stories spread, is when you put babies and children in it, you get conspiracy theories all around the place. Well, 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 well I think the significant thing is this is a graveyard, 
Mm -hmm. You see, if you wanted to come up with a false narrative, uh, working on a graveyard is a great help to you because the main witnesses are all dead. Yeah. <laughs> and it's quite typical for there not to be too much documentation on graveyards. For example, church documentation tends to be very good, marriages and baptisms, whatever, it's never very good on deaths. So, so you know, it's very interesting. We have this now in Canada. There's a huge outcry in Canada, supposedly, you know, vast numbers of people have died. But it looks much the same thing, that they went in to recognise graveyards and then say they all died and just make assumptions about how they all died. And, and aren't they intent going from here into virtually all of the graveyards attached to mother and baby homes, dig them up and, then, you know, and make a scandal out of it, when in fact it just is a graveyard. They had to die and this is where they were buried. You know, of itself there was no scandal. You made a very important point there earlier on. And I think it's been skipped over and missed by the Commission as well. And that's the non-registration of births. Yeah. People didn't register births. They didn't register deaths either. Yeah. There was no incentive for them. In order to register a birth or a death, you had to come into town all the way into the, the nearest administrative town, yeah. which gets us be tuned for here. It's yeah. only down the road. Yeah. But for a lot of people out the country, that was a huge journey. And yeah. there was no cars or that at the time. Yeah. And you had to sit in the registrar's office wait, then present the documentation while he or she wrote it into the, into the, the, the books. Yeah. Now, they buried their children in killings, you yeah. know, in cemeteries all over the place. Another falsehood is that it's only unbaptized children that are buried in killings. That's not yeah. the case. Yeah. That was the local cemetery. Yeah. And there's a great account in uh, Dr. James Deeney's book, who gets mentioned by the commission on several occasions, because he was the chief medical officer, the chief medical advisor yeah. to the government, yeah. the equivalent of Tony Houlihan now. Yeah. And he has an account where his deputy, Dr. Sterling Berry, Winslow Sterling Berry, yeah. went around the country closing down all the unofficial uh, burial sites. Yeah. And he carried a revolver because he was a Protestant, <laughs> just in case he was closing down all these Catholic cemeteries, yeah. in case any of them would attack him. But they didn't. Yeah. So as you say, when the children's allowance came in, yeah. God, there was an so, incentive now to yeah. register the births, because yeah. you yeah. get money out of the state. Yeah. So yeah. that was one thing. That but was the debts there still wasn't. Many of them didn't have, when it came to the debts, they didn't have property. Yeah. They didn't have life assurance. They didn't have anything. Yeah. So what's the point in registering the debt? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Just bury them up, up the road yeah. and yeah. be done with it. You yeah. know? Yeah. No expense of all this yeah. uh, coming in and out. Yeah. And I think the... Uh, Burials were still going on, unregistered burials were still going on until 1973 in parts of Mayo. Up yeah. to 50% of the burials were, were done without yeah. without any of the, yeah. the documentation. Yeah. And, 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 and just, and the, yeah. just one other thing, yeah. is that it, the, there weren't individual grave markers. Sometimes yeah. there might be a stone left around, yeah. but there was nobody putting up headstones. That's what I was going this, to is, yeah. this, yeah. Is, yeah. this is yeah. a cemetery. Yeah. It doesn't have individual headstones, yeah. but it's yeah. marked out clearly as a cemetery. Yeah. And it was well known about, it's on the yeah. maps yeah. and everything. So. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of people in unmarked yeah. graves. Yeah, and that was the norm. You see. Yes, they didn't the norm. have headstones. And even today, yeah. in, in Hart Island in, in New York, the yeah. paupers are buried. They call it a pauper burial, or now it's called a public health burial. That if you die and your family can't afford a funeral, well, the, the, the local authorities will bury you. There's one million people buried in unmarked graves in Hart Island. Yeah. And you should see the kids are in little timber boxes, and yeah. they're all just being buried there. And if you see the photographs of that, it brings home exactly yeah. what the story is. That if you're a pauper and you can't afford a funeral, you'll yeah. get buried on the cheap. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. The one thing they did have, though, was coffins. And there's some huge amount of evidence about yeah. coffins. It's all there in all the papers and all the documentation. And people even know uh, local carpenters around here who made coffins for the children's home. And references to the, to the size of the coffins and countless references to it. So they're all buried with coffins. I mean, you know, and uh, how are you going to put a coffin through the small little slit that, that is in these, uh, you know, the, that structure is beyond anybody. You know, so to clarify, when they dig up, as I say, that's the long structure mm -hmm. parallel to that wall. When you look at it, it's all bones. There's no wood. It's, there's no coffins. So, so you have the, ref, the documented evidence that they're buried with coffins, and yet, so that, so that means, because they're all individual scattered bones, that means that had to be a reburial. They were buried with coffins originally, yeah. and probably in that area, just behind that camera, your cameras there, along that access road, they, they dug them up, they just had the bones, and they just scattered, scattered the bones in that structure. It has to be a reburial. You know, so that, that's how you... No, that, that's Brian's theory. I'm not in 100% agreement with him on, on, on that. <laughs> yeah. um, because I think they buried them on, on the cheap, you know, in, yeah. in, in there, that they just, there was a structure there, either it was in place, or yeah. it wasn't purpose built, but they decided to reuse it as a burial crypt. Yeah, yeah. And it was a burial crypt. Yeah. Now, the, the remains are disarticulated, we know from that on, on the top. Yeah. But the reason for that is groundwater. 
Yeah. Now, groundwater has been in the chamber, we know that from the fifth interim report. And if you look up there, you'll see that those houses are higher up than this site here. This is on a gentle slope and all the groundwater will be traveling down here. It seems to accumulate around here and it goes into the chamber. And it went into the chamber and it floated up one little bone which Catherine Corral said was impacted up there by the force of sewage, which it wasn't because yeah. they haven't excavated that. Yeah. They found this little hand phallus, one of those tiny little bones, had been floated up gently by the groundwater. Now the thing about it is, cemeteries are usually built on high ground to stop the groundwater uh, yeah. getting into the coffins and that. Yeah. But if you cross the road just over there, is the main tomb cemetery. And it's even lower gradient than here. Yeah. There's something very peculiar about the, the hydrology here, yeah. I think, and that's what's caused the remains to become disarticulated. Maybe yeah. they could have been put in, yeah. taken, maybe when they yeah. go down a bit further, but we haven't, yeah. we don't know that question yet. Yeah. The yeah. other thing they say is that they took soil samples and found that it was contaminated with sewage. Yeah. Now this whole area and even beyond is contaminated with sewage yeah. because there were reports in the newspapers of the septic tanks here or the cesspits overflowing into the neighbouring properties and the Board of Guardians compensated the grazier and the landowner. Yeah. So there's, um, uh, there's, this was, sewage was treated here and obviously if it's here after 60 years nearly since the, since the home closed, it must be from, it's still detectable in the soil. That yeah. doesn't mean that that was particularly used as a sewage treatment yeah. plant. You cannot, you cannot come to that either, you yeah. know, that conclusion either. Yeah. So, but the groundwater has been in there. And definitely groundwater has disarticulated the remains or they could be in there, as you say. I, and I do, I, it, it's, why is it marked out as far as out there at that end? Yeah. The burial ground is marked on the maps as taken in that car park. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. Why is it so big? Yeah. And now it's so small. Yeah. So it could be, you could be right. Yeah. But we won't know until well, the, the well, excavation is done that they did yeah. dig up the bones and they yeah. did throw them in. See, look at it this way. You hear stories from all of those houses there. Every time they go digging in their front garden and they're digging this and that, they come across all these bones. Yeah. So, so inevitably then, you know, working by that theory, if the council had to build that access road and build that, uh, you know, uh, playground, they had to have come across lots of bones. You know, what were they going to do with them? Well, they've so, come across burials out there. Yeah. on the road when they were digging it up that's and right. that was workhouse burials. Yeah, that's another yeah. example. So, so what would they do? See, they, that's what they would do. They, they knew this area was to be the remaining burial ground. So they'd move whatever they found there and just put it here. Yeah. And, and probably that structure around there is not the only one. Because you, you probably heard, maybe the general public watching this, might have heard about a story of people falling into a kind of a box of bones in the 1970s. But curiously, that's not that structure. We know that because uh, we, one of the guys who fell in pointed out where he did fall in, and it's approximately there. It's, it's, that's the structure, long structure there, and the crypt is over there, and that's, that's where the, about, about level with that gate, but, but there. And uh, so, so it looks like there are probably more kind of boxes, if you want to put it like that, uh, where, where I believe that they reburied them, not just that one. That's my guess. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Any, anybody's any questions or anything? Um, I, I have a question for you, Jean. <coughs> Just when you were speaking about earlier, the comparison from the times between now and back then, and that now that they have so much more money, do you think that that money is being spent on more barbarical things on healthcare for children today than they were back then? As in, like, abortion and things like that, to, to, to the way they're treating children. That's, that's really the question. Um. I don't know is, is, is the, the, the question. What? I don't know, sorry. Yeah, well, uh, just that, you know. I don't know the answer to your question. Yeah, if it's just, you know, they're trying to say that they put babies into septic tanks. Yeah. But just to what's going on today with babies is actually a lot worse than being babies being put into septic tanks, yeah. you know. It, it, there's a large degree of incompetence in Tozla. Now, it stems from the way it's founded. And this has been found in the baby P case over in England that a young child, a two-year-old toddler, was murdered by his mother and boyfriend through neglect and abuse, really. And he was under the care of social workers. That's happened here several times as well. So there's been big failures in social worker. Now, the reason is, if you want to become a social worker, you have to go into college and study sociology and then get a master's degree in sociology, in, in social, to be a social worker. Yeah. Now, sociology is the wrong discipline entirely. It's about studying society. You cannot protect families and people in crisis using the studies of Marx, Durkheim and Weber. 
I mean, that's what the whole thing is about. It should be psychology. That's the, yeah. the, that's the proper discipline for training social workers, not sociology. But sociology is useless. If you go in and get a sociology degree, it's practically useless. You can mm. do nothing with it. So to give a bit of use to it, they train social workers. And that's where the incompetence lies. People who can write a great essay about what theorists said what are suddenly in charge of families trying to deal with families in crisis. And that's where the failings are in, in the modern day. There, there might be other abuses going on, as you say, like mm. giving young kids abortions and things like that. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think they've presented any figures. Uh, it wouldn't be beyond the, the bounds of possibility, mm. you know, mm. uh, and it could happen. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Any more questions? No. I think we've covered it pretty well. Yeah. Well done, guys. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well done. Thanks for coming down, you know. <laughs>